energy defense. And then we'll wrap up with an open Q&A session and then move to a, a closed door Q&A session with just the committee members. So first, um, I want to say, so Haruki joined Stanford in 2015, which is the same time I joined Stanford. And uh, he was one of the first students that I spoke with in my in the first class that I taught at Stanford. And uh, I have to say, after talking with Haruki uh, after class a few times and sort of hearing his thoughts on modeling multi-robot systems and dealing especially with stochasticity and multi-robot systems, I thought, wow, Stanford students are special students. I had spent some time in another university for a few years and I thought, wow, this is, pretty extraordinary, the level of sophistication that Stanford students have. And uh, of course that's true, but I think even Haruki is special among Stanford students for mathematical sophistication and sort of critical thinking with regards to ideas that he hears about. So all the work that he's done in research towards his PhD focuses on dealing with the messy randomness that robots encounter in the world. Um, so dealing with uh, humans and how humans, maybe pedestrians move around on the street or, or walk through open spaces, dealing with other autonomous agents, other robots and communicating with those robots through motion um, and uh, just generally reasoning rigorously about how you can quantify your uncertainty in models and still produce some kind of safety guarantees when you're working with, with stochastic models. Um, one thing that really, I think, sets Haruki's research style apart from the other students I've worked with is, um, is a kind of, I would say, old school scientific objectivity. This is really valuable um, and really rare, I'd say, and sort of against the grain of, of current scientific practices or, or trends. So I would say nobody is a harsher critic of Haruki's work than Haruki. Uh, frequently, he'll come to me and say, um, you know, here's an idea, here's some preliminary results. And I'll say, great, let's write a paper. This is really strong. And I'll say, nah, no, no, let me check it against some other benchmarks. And he'll run some simulations and he'll say, ah, mine does about 50% better, but I only tried, you know, over 10,000 trials. I really want to do it over 20,000 trials. And so he's extremely thorough. And really when he publishes a result, he has to be quite sure that that result stands on its merits. And that's really laudable. I want to also say that, um, the work that he's done stands at a really couple of really important intersections in modern robotics research, which I think uh, is really good news for, for Haruki's professional career going forward, and that he has some insights in, this, in these intersections. So one intersection is model-based versus machine learning based or data-driven. Um, so model-based of course is like, we have mathematical models derived through physical principles. This constitutes sort of traditional engineering methodology. And then the more modern techniques are based on collecting lots of data and inferring models from those data. And uh, Haruki's work really spans these two schools of thought. The other crossroads where Haruki's research lives is between perception and control. So of course, perception is how robots gather information from their environment and control is how robots take that information and decide to turn that into actions. And most researchers are squarely in one camp or the other. And there's quite a large conceptual divide between the two. And I think Haruki is a rare researcher who has one foot in both of these disciplines. So uh, Haruki, I'm very excited to hear about what you have to say. And uh, I'll turn the floor over to you. Thank you for the very kind introduction, Mac. And uh, thank you very much, uh, everyone, um, for joining uh, my thesis defense today. Let me go ahead and share my screen and uh, start the presentation. And there's one announcement um, that I'm going to make before starting this uh, presentation. You might see this uh, some grayish uh, rectangle uh, at the top right corner of the slide. Uh, this is for you to place the secondary zoom window so that my face doesn't uh, interfere with the um, um, the, the slides. So uh, please take the time if you need to, uh, to adjust your screen size. And I think there's plenty of space for you to uh, fit the secondary zoom window. And can hear everyone hear me okay? Yes, we hear you great. Great. Uh, yeah, so uh, let's go ahead and start it. Uh, hi, hello, I'm Haruki Nishimura. Uh, today I'm presenting on my thesis titled 
online trajectory planning uh, algorithms for robotic systems under uncertainty in interactive environments. I'd like to start this presentation by claiming that the technolo technology surrounding mobile robots have made a huge leap over the last decade. Perhaps one of the most representative examples is the automated warehouses. And as you can see, there are thousands of mobile robots that autonomously operate in logistics centers to internally deliver goods or pack grocery items. And without any doubts, this has been enabled by sophisticated planning and control algorithms showing how capable they are. But at the same time, we also witnessed how incapable the mobile robots were. This poor security robot in the picture was unable to recognize and avoid the pond and just drowned there. Well, in this particular incident, no one was injured, luckily, but in fact, the security robot made by the same company had collided into a child a year before at the Stanford Shopping Center. So considering the weight and the momentum of this robot, it could have caused a serious consequence. Now, I'm not citing on this particular company today to blame their product, but rather to clarify what mobile robots can and cannot do with the current technology. So let's compare the two mobile robotic systems and highlight the differences at a high level. In the case of automated warehouses, we immediately realize that the environment is very well structured. Well, there's a clear boundary between the robot's workspace and the rest of the facility, and the space inside the boundary is only occupied by the robots, who are all connected to the same network and controlled by a central computer. On the other hand, the work environment for the security robot is more open and interactive in that there's no clear boundary for the workspace and there are many things that the robot must interact with, including other humans, obstacles, and objects. This is why the environment on the right is more challenging for today's mobile robots. However, if they can reliably operate in such an interactive environment, then we will be able to apply the robotic technology to many more practical applications than we see today, including, for example, goods delivery, serving in restaurants, fully autom automated, automated driving, and search and rescue missions. In order to unlock that capability, the robot must be able to recognize and address uncertainty that inherently exists in such open and interactive environments. And uncertainty can exhibit itself in many ways. Firstly, the robot cannot perfectly know the current state of the world due to limited perception. And this can significantly impede successful task accomplishment. For example, this search and rescue drone here cannot deliver medical equipment if it doesn't know where the injured person is. To address this challenge, the robot must actively reduce uncertainty using onboard perception. Second, even without uncertainty about the current time, there still can be uncertainty about the future. This is due to inherently random phenomena or imperfect knowledge about models of the world that the robot has access to. For example, a self-driving car on a public road must interact with a lot of other decision-making agents, such as humans or human-driven cars, whose motion are difficult to predict in the future. In those scenarios, the robot must be resilient to the future uncertainty, especially to events that are rare but catastrophic. This thesis addresses such challenges of inherent uncertainty in open and interactive environments by proposing computationally tractable and efficient trajectory planning methods. The rest of the presentation consists of the three sections shown here, which collectively address the challenges mentioned in the previous slide. Each section is based on the papers published at conferences or in journals. Unfortunately, in the interest of time, only the content from the papers in bold letters will be presented today. And before we begin, I'd like to note that all the proposed methods are model-based and probability use probability theory to quantify the uncertainty. This means that we give the robot a cost function that represents a given task structure, along with a probability distribution that characterizes its uncertainty. The robot takes this information to formulate a scalar objective function and minimize it to find an optimal control policy subject to stochastic dynamics models and also the actuation limits. This optimization is performed online 
meaning that the robot resolves the same problem at the next time step. This general framework of online optimization is well known in the literature as model predictive control or receding horizon planning. Now let's begin by looking at the active uncertainty reduction problem. To better motivate this problem, let us first look at examples that we are very familiar with as humans. In psychology and neuroscience, humans are known to have a natural ability to actively reduce uncertainty using their perceptual systems. This reduction is known to occur in two cases. The first case is when uncertainty reduction, reduction is necess necessary to successfully accomplish a known task. For example, this bicyclist must first look at both right and left to make sure that there's no oncoming traffic in order to make the decision to cross the road safely. Uh, on, on the other hand, the second case is a little more complicated. Humans can use perception to reduce uncertainty without any relevance to known tasks. This so-called intrinsically motivated reduction happens, for example, when they see an optical illusion or a magic. In this situation, humans try to resolve confusing or conflicting perceptual information through active vision or touch or other sensing modalities. So how humans neural mechanisms work in those scenarios are not perfectly known. However, recent research in computational neuroscience hypothesized a unifying theory that could explain part of the mechanism. This theory views the uncertainty reduction as an optimization problem based on probabilistic inference. In this model, a decision-making agent always maintains a belief which parameterizes a probability distribution over unknown states. The agent can influence the state through its action and receives perceptual signal as an observation. And finally, the agent's control action influences how the belief evolves over time. This system is called the belief dynamics, which is a well-defined dynamical system. Specifically, this dynamics model corresponds to the recursive Bayesian inference procedure, and this is well known in the estimation theory. In this framework, the agent also seeks for an optimum policy to minimize a belief-based cost that is accumulated over time. And depending on the cost definition, different types of uncertainty reduction will happen. For example, we can encode the task-related information as a state-dependent cost function and take the expectation with respect to the belief distribution. Doing so will induce task-oriented uncertainty reduction. On the other hand, if the cost is an explicit function of the distribution that penalizes its dispersion, for example, this entropy function, then the agent becomes intrinsically motivated. Of course, human's neural mechanism can, mechanism can be more complicated than this theory. However, we can still leverage this framework to implement a robotic agent capable of active uncertainty reduction. Indeed, this framework already has a name in robotics and it is called belief space planning. Actually, the history of belief space planning in robotics dates back to decades ago in a couple of domains. First, a problem known as partially observable Markov decision processes or POMDPs was first formulated in 1965 and then applied to robotics and artificial intelligence in the late 90s. This formulation specifically corresponds to the task-oriented case. On the other hand, the problem of intrinsically motivated reduction has been addressed in a domain called active perception. The basic idea appeared in as early as 1970 and mathematically formulated as a belief space planning problem in 1988. Since then, belief space planning has been an active research topic in the robotics community owing to its generality and broad applicability to many practical problems. Now let's see some specific examples. On the left, a manipulation robot needs to drag the plate to a known goal. However, the parameters of the dynamics, such as the mass, friction coefficients, moments of inertia, are not known to the robot, which again, I think is uh, quite realistic and it has to reduce the uncertainty of those parameters to successfully move the plate to the goal. This is a great example of task-oriented uncertainty reduction. 
And on the right, a mobile robot has to persistently track moving targets in the two-dimensional environment. However, the robot is only equipped with a noisy range sensor to only receive one-dimensional information at each time. With belief space planning, we can intrinsically motivate the robot to keep the uncertainty level low. As a result, the robot naturally explores the environment to effectively perform persistent monitoring tasks. And these problems are seemingly different on the surface, but we can actually solve both of them by the same framework of belief space planning. However, this generality always comes at a cost. And in general, it's impossible to solve belief space planning problems exactly. And this is for two reasons. Firstly, belief space is essentially a high dimensional and continuous space of probability distributions, which makes the planning difficult. And even worse, the planning is further complicated by the fact that future observations are stochastic at planning times. Therefore, existing methods are all approximate and based on certain assumptions. Specifically, there are three kinds of approaches, greedy, tree search, and local trajectory optimization. In order to explain how each of those methods work, we'll use a toy problem of one-dimensional manipulation. This is a greatly simplified task in that there's no uncertainty just to explain the existing methods. First, the greedy approach completely ignores the future of the system and optimizes the current action only, in this case, the force control. And because of that, it's the most computationally efficient, but it doesn't always work. Secondly, the tree search approach typically assumes a finite set of possible actions in order to simulate the many possible scenarios of the future in the form of sampling and store the results in a tree. It finally picks the best scenario and applies it to the system. In fact, there are many belief space planners that take the form of the tree search, and many of them have asymptotic convergence properties to near optimal policies. However, actions computed by finite samples are noisy, and also the sample complexity can be too high for online real-time applications. Lastly, the trajectory optimization approach iteratively refines the space-time trajectory of the system using the physics model. Once the solution has converged, then the, and the entire trajectory is executed. And this might be the most natural approach to controlling physical systems where we can leverage Newtonian dynamics. However, these methods often ignore stochasticity of future observations, and also the computation time can be too long to run online because of high dimensionality and the multiple iterations needed to reach convergence. So to tackle this problem, we propose a novel algorithm called stochastic sequential action control. And this is significantly different from any of the existing works in belief space planning. For instance, unlike trajectory optimization methods, our algorithm fully considers stochasticity in future observations. The key idea behind our approach is something called the local perturbation of a nominal policy. The main philosophy here is to give up on fully optimizing the policy. So we start with some imperfect nominal policy, which can be some heuristic or simply a zero control. In this example, let's apply some nominal policy that completely overshoots. And instead of refining this trajectory, like the trajectory optimization method, we go ahead and execute this trajectory anyways until we realize that this would not make it. Then we intervene with the system and perturb it with an impulsive control in order to compensate for the, compensate for the imperfect policy. We can repeat this process indefinitely. And if we can do this sufficiently fast, then the resulting trajectory will actually look quite close to the optimal one. This impulsive perturbation is formally called the mode insertion gradient. And the idea of optimizing this quantity was recently proposed in a paper titled Sequential Action Control, or SAC for short. 
This algorithm can derive the optimal perturbation in closed form. However, it's limited to deterministic physical systems. So our measure contribution here is the extension of SAC to a class of dynamical systems called stochastic hybrid systems with time-driven switching. Without too many details, it turns out that the belief dynamics that we are interested in here fall into this category. So we can perform belief space planning using this control theoretic framework. With stochastic SAC, we gain extra efficiency over conventional methods since the optimization can be done in just two steps. In the first phase, we simulate the belief dynamics under the imperfect nominal policy into the future. In doing so, we will perform Monte Carlo sampling of different stochastic future observations to account for their stochasticity. It turns out that these sample trajectories already carry all the necessary information about the optimal perturbation. So in the second phase, we can utilize this information to solve a quadratic minimization problem for the perturbation variable. This minimization is convex and even has a closed form solution. So this can be optimized instantaneously. Now let's see how stochastic SAC performs on the manipulation task under the parameter uncertainty. On the right is our stochastic SAC algorithm repeatedly applied to the system online which is able to drag the plate successfully and stay close to the goal. On the left are comparisons of different baseline methods. And notice how noisy the actions are for this tree search method on, on the top left corner. And this is due to the limited time budget to enable online computation. And overall, the single performance plot well summarizes all the algorithms. Y axis in this plot is the error between the pose of the object and the goal. So the lower, the better. And this clearly shows that our algorithm reduces the manipulation error faster than the other baseline methods under a limited time budget for online computation. This concludes the first section of this thesis. We've shown that robots can effectively reduce perception related uncertainty by solving belief space planning problems. A novel planning algorithm is presented based on a local perturbation of a nominal policy, and the algorithm is named stochastic sequential action control. Now we'd like to transition to the next section that's focused on the uncertainty in the future, especially the one due to inherent randomness of the dynamical process. For the rest of the talk, we assume that the current state is perfectly known by the robot and the perception is sufficiently accurate that the robot does not have to perform belief space planning anymore. The challenge that we'd like to address in this section is represented in this single video. This is a recording of a dash cam attached to a Tesla Model 3 vehicle on a highway. You can see that there's a Subaru immediately to the right of the Tesla car and the camera sees the Subaru all the time. However, the car could not avoid the accident when the Subaru suddenly decided to change its lane because their relative positions were not prepared for such an unexpected interaction. Now, it's not clear whether the autopilot was on or off, but one thing that's certain is that the Tesla car was unable to consider such an event that is rare but catastrophic. Specifically, this very small probability that the Subaru could suddenly change its land to exit the high to exit the highway. So if we roughly plot the probability of each interaction with its monetary cost, let's say, then that can look something like this. As you can see, this is a highly multimodal distribution due to multimodality in the decision making of the Subaru car. Most of the probability is on the low cost side with no accidents. However, there's a small probability that the Subaru would change the lane, which could lead to high cost accidents. For systems that involve stochasticity, we would normally optimize the expected value of the cost. And this was indeed the case for the BD space planning problem we discussed earlier. However, if we have to control the robot under a highly multimodal distribution, simply optimizing the expected value is undesirable. And the autonomous driving systems, for example, 
have to be designed to work under such multimodal and long-tailed distributions. In robotics, this is a kind of problems addressed in risk-aware planning. So let's first review prior work in this field, especially in the autonomous robot navigation literature. First, deep reinforcement learning methods are often used for autonomous robot navigation, where an end-to-end -end policy is learned prior to the deployment. However, the learned policy is not risk-aware in most of the existing works. It also leaves a practical issue of training the robot in a real environment with actual humans. For this reason, these methods typically train the policy entirely in a simulated environment. The other three methods are all risk-aware and model-based. First, chance-constrained planning seeks for a policy that satisfies a, satisfies a safety constraint with at least a specified probability. This constraint is intuitive to interpret, but exact optimization of the policy under multimodal distributions remains challenging. Alternatively, conditional value at risk optimization and risk-sensitive optimal control both treat risk as an objective function to be minimized. While the objectives are different, they both penalize distributions that have a long tail. However, existing methods are limited to unimodal distributions, linear systems, or discrete problems. A notable exception is a recently proposed work by Wang et al. for chance constraint planning, but their policy can be, become overly conservative for interaction with a large number of humans or other agents on the road. So in our work, we take a risk-sensitive optimal control approach due to better tractability of the objective. We then propose a scalable algorithm for online autonomous navigation in a human crowd with the capability to handle nonlinear dynamics as well as arbitrary distributions. We achieve these desirable properties by extending the stochastic SAC algorithm presented in the previous section to risk-sensitive optimal control. Our extension begins by modeling the crowd-robot interaction as a joint dynamical system. Specifically, the robot is treated in continuous time for high-frequency control. And on the other hand, the human's positions are modeled by stochastic discrete time dynamics. Here, the discrete time nature is because of a practical assumption that the position information of the humans is provided by sensor readings at a certain frequency to the robot. This underlying distribution P is most likely non-Gaussian because human motion is most likely multimodal. And we don't require the robot to know the analytical expression for this P. Mathematically speaking, this takes a similar form to belief-based planning. In fact, this is a stochastic hybrid system with time-driven switching, so we can actually apply the framework of stochastic SAC to this joint system. However, there's one thing that's unique to this new problem, which is that we are now treating a risk-sensitive objective called the entropic risk measure. The entropic risk is defined by this formula and takes the distribution P, a user-defined cost function J, as well as a risk sensitivity parameter theta. This looks like some complicated math, but if we tailor expand this objective, it reveals some structure that this objective actually takes into account the variance and other higher order moments of the distribution in addition to the mean. From this equation, we can tell that the robot is risk neutral if theta is zero, because then the robot only cares about the expected value. On the other hand, more weights will be put on the variance if theta becomes larger, which makes the robot more and more risk sensitive. Although the objective is different from the previous formulation of stochastic SAC, we are actually able to show that the optimization of the local perturbation is still possible for this entropic risk. Now, remember from the previous section that the optimization problem for the stochastic SAC had a quadratic formula for the perturbation variable. It turns out that the objective is still quadratic for this new risk sensitive optimization, where the only difference is in the coefficient term. And this new coefficient term can be computed by simply simulating the system while sampling stochastic human transitions from the model, just, just like before. 
Therefore, the algorithm remains the same. We simulate the stochastic human robot system under some imperfect nominal policy, and then optimize this quadratic objective for the local perturbation. Now we have obtained a model-based algorithm that can efficiently plan the robot's trajectory with risk awareness. Uh, but there's one remaining issue. We still need a generative distribution that models humans' decision-making and their motion into the future. For this, thanks to recent advances in deep generative modeling, there's a few data-driven models that can provide samples of plausible future human motion. In our work, we chose to use a novel trajectory forecasting model called Trajectum++, which is recently proposed by Saltzman, Ivanovich, and co-authors. Trajectum++ is, is a deep recurrent neural network architecture and explicitly accounts for social interactions and dynamics through a spatiotemporal graph structure. This model uses a conditional variational autoencoder with a discrete categorical latent variable, which captures the inherent multimodality of future, future human motion. And we chose this particular framework because of its superior accuracy over similar existing works and high computational efficiency in generating samples. One other important feature of Trajectory Plus Plus is the ability to make predictions that are conditioned on the future trajectory candidate of the robot. This conditional prediction models, models the mutual nature of human-robot interaction, and we used this feature in our real-world experiment. Overall, the model we used was trained on pedestrian motion data sets that are publicly available. This trajectory plus plus was combined with our risk-sensitive SAC algorithm, and we first conducted a simulation study against four other baselines in an actual scene that is clipped from the test data set. And in this study, we tested the risk-neutral version of our algorithm. In the performance plot on the left, uh, safe and efficient algorithms appear towards the top right corner. The baseline methods include three model-based planners and a deep learning policy. This plot shows that our approach in, red, in the red star best balanced the safety and efficiency, achieving effective robotic navigation while avoiding collisions. And most notably, the deep learning policy shown in, red, in yellow, yellow here completely fails in this scenario, even though it was trained by a state-of-the-art attention-based deep reinforcement learning method. This is because the algorithm needs to access the simulator for training that models the human behavior, and the simulated environment does not perfectly replicate the real world. In contrast, our framework does not suffer from this problem because Trajectory Plus Plus can be trained entirely on real pedestrian data sets directly to train a predictive model of the hu human motion. Um, in the next study, we investigated the effects of risk sensitivity on the crowd robot interaction. As desired, the empirical results show that a risk sensitive robot stays further away from humans to have more safety margin. Interestingly, in addition to that, Yielding behavior does emerge out of the risk sensitivity, as you can see here. This is in fact reasonable because a risk sensitive robot is penalized by being in a state with high un higher uncertainty in near future, as represented by those spaghetti-like predictions of trajectory plus plus. And our simulation study was finally followed by a real world experiment where we asked five human subjects to walk at their normal speeds to designated goals. The robot's goal was randomized after each run and not revealed to the humans. First, we tested our robot with the risk neutral planner for five runs. As you can see, the robot was unable to interact well with the human and collided. Overall, we observed that the robot got too close to passing humans. We then tested our risk sensitive robot. This significantly improved the safety margin and the robot was able to navigate to the goal without a single collision throughout the five rounds. This concludes the second section of this thesis. We've proposed risk sensitive sequential action control as an efficient solution to risk aware planning in interactive environments.
Now, we'd like to think about the issue of imperfect modeling uh, as in the last section. And this has been completely ignored in all the previous sections. The imperfect modeling issue in stochastic systems can be well summarized in this single slide. Successful planning often critically depends on the quality of the stochastic prediction model. To further convince ourselves, let's see some simulation where our risk sensitive SAC algorithm is run in the same environment as before. However, in this one, we treat the humans as a static obstacle plus some Gaussian random walk. As you can see, the robot completely fails to avoid collision, even though the planner was the same as before. Of course, this is an extreme example. No one would treat humans as static obstacles nowadays, but this shows that an imperfect model of the future can lead to disastrous failure. And even worse, there's recent work suggesting that even modern data-driven models are not free from this issue. Indeed, there's a well-known quote in the robotics community that says no model is perfect, but some are useful. So if no model is perfect, then how can we handle this issue of potential model mismatch? Well, as a first step, let's consider our model choice as a point in the set of all distributions that could describe a stochastic phenomenon, such as this human behavior. In other words, each point in this space corresponds to our knowledge of how randomly things behave. We are aware that our model is not perfect and that there's another point in the set that actually corresponds to the ground truth. However, the issue here is that we cannot exactly know or model this ground truth. The best thing we can do so therefore is to estimate some, some sort of metric that tells us how close the two models are in this set using some data collected in the past. Using such a metric as a hint, we can construct a subset A of this entire set S that likely includes the ground truth. We have made some progress here since we have effectively narrowed down the number of possible models that we need to consider. This subset A is known as the ambiguity set in the literature. Once we derive such an ambiguity set, then we can use it for the robot to plan against a worst case distribution. This problem formulation is known as distributionally robust control. Prior work in this domain models the ambiguity set using different methods. First, an ambiguity set can be defined based on partial knowledge of the true model, such as the mean and the variance parameters. However, the policy derived using such a set is often too conservative. The other two methods, Wasserstein metric and f-divergence-based constructions, rely on the notion of statistical distances to build an ambiguity set. Specifically, the ambiguity set includes all possible models whose statistical distance from our baseline model is less than a certain threshold. They are less conservative than moment-based methods, but existing solution methods are not suited for nonlinear systems with continuous distributions. So in our work, we focus on an ambiguity set that's based on a particular f-divergence called the KL divergence. However, unlike previous work, our method yields a locally optimal feedback policy for nonlinear systems with continuous distributions. This is achieved by turning the distributionally robust control problem into an equivalent problem of risk sensitive optimal control. Mathematically, we're interested in deriving a feedback control policy that minimizes the worst case expected cost of the control objective out of the ambiguity set. This problem by itself seems intractable because we have to solve the maximization problem with respect to a probability distribution. Well, in fact, we can leverage mathematical results shown in control theory to transform the original problem into an equivalent problem of risk sensitive optimal control. As a result, we obtain a nested optimization problem with respect to the control policy, as well as the risk sensitivity parameter theta. So this can be interpreted as a risk sensitive optimal control that also optimizes the risk sensitivity parameter. 
One nice thing about this new formulation is that there's no optimization with respect to the unknown distribution anymore. It's our choice to set this model distribution Q and we use, to choose, we use a Gaussian model because of its nice analytical properties. However, this minimization is still intractable in general because of the nonlinearity in the dynamics and the closed loop nature of our control policy. So in order to obtain a tractable solution, we leverage iterative LEQG algorithm, which is a recently proposed method that can compute a locally optimal affine state feedback control policy. On the other hand, the outer loop problem is just a one dimensional optimization problem that's generally non-convex. This essentially corresponds to finding the best risk sensitivity parameter. We choose to locally optimize data with a method called the cross entropy method, which samples lots of different data and aggregates the information to converge onto a locally optimal choice. So we combine iterative LEQG with the cross entropy method and name the overall algorithm risk order tuning iterative LQR or RAT ILQR. We evaluated the performance of the proposed approach in a synthetic collision avoidance scenario where noise added to humans constant velocity model is given by a Gaussian mixture distribution that the robot does not know. The robot instead uses the simpler uh, Gaussian distribution as a baseline model and estimate the KL divergence bound between the two distributions using samples drawn from this true model offline. However, at the runtime, our robot does not know or have access to the true model. For comparison, we showed a collision avoidance performance with two other baselines, ILQG and PETS. ILQG does not account for any distribution robustness and simply relies on our baseline Gaussian model for predicting future human motion. PETS, on the other hand, is a sampling-based stochastic method for model predictive control. This framework does, re does require access to the true Gaussian mixture distribution for sampling. As can be seen, RAT ILQR dynamically adjusts the risk sensitivity value, sensitivity value over time and staying the furthest away from the pedestrian in red uh, among the three algorithms. This resulted in the safest robot navigation for our algorithm under the model mismatch, as opposed to the other two methods that had multiple collisions. Now, this demonstrates the effectiveness of our distributionally robust approach, but you might also think that a similar performance could be achieved by conventional risk sensitive optimal control because our approach is basically a special kind of risk sensitive method. To answer that question, let's now discuss the practical benefits of ILQR over conventional methods. You could actually think of the conventional methods as a controller, controller that has a knob to tune the risk sensitivity. As a user, you would have to manually turn this knob. This is a problem because this knob does not have any absolute scales and the scaling also changes depending on the problem. Even worse, it remains unclear what value of risk sensitivity is the most desirable. This is a highly subjective quantity, which also differs from task to task and person to person. With RAT ILQR, all of those issues are gone because this knob is turned automatically and dynamically so that the controller becomes optimally robust under the model mismatch. These practical benefits are actually reflected into performance improvement in the previous intersection scenario that is shown here. For the conventional approach, we naively turned the knob so that the controller is maximally risk sensitive all the time. Without much uh, background knowledge or uh, expert knowledge, this is the safest thing or the best thing we could do. And comparing this with our new algorithm, there's no actually no difference in terms of safety. Both controllers had no collisions. However, our controller achieves more improved quality for tracking the desired trajectory. And compared to the naive approach, the, the average tracking error is reduced by 16%, 
meaning that our controller achieves more efficient navigation without sacrificing safety. We are talking about this because the safety and efficiency are two concepts that are usually conflicting. And this is where conventional risk sensitive methods struggle to find the right balance between the two. With RAT ILQR, this issue is addressed and the user does not have to subjectively specify that trade off. So this finally concludes the last section of this thesis. We discussed the issues arising from imperfect modeling of the possible futures and proposed a planning algorithm that is distributionally robust to such stochastic model mismatches. Now I'd like to move on to the future work section. Um, so to summarize, what we have addressed in this talk so far is concerned with a single module, namely planning and control under uncertainty in the entire autonomy stack. From this perspective, we didn't care much about what, pre what provides us with the dynamics models and associated uncertainty quantification. They can come from some domain knowledge or could be a data-driven model, but we just didn't care too much about what that is. However, we cannot ignore the fact that many modern autonomous systems consist of deep learned perception and prediction modules. So in designing such hybrid systems, we should not treat each part entirely separately. Instead, we need a better treatment of both modules such that they are seamlessly integrated into a unified system with a common interface. Well, this is an entirely open research question and we should ask ourselves, how should we design such an interface? And also how should we build the entire autonomy stack for a more streamlined, uncertainty aware perception, prediction and planning? Well, I'd like to keep pursuing these research questions in future work. So thank you very much for your uh, attention today and listening to my talk. And uh, at this moment, uh, I'd like to, I'm happy to uh, take any questions that you may have. Thank you. Great, thanks Haruki. Let's give Haruki a hand. Um, okay, so I'm going to make a proposal, actually, Haruki. So um, in most defenses I've seen, I don't know if you have acknowledgments. I assume you do. In I most do. defenses, um, we would go straight through the acknowledgments and then save the Q&A until after the acknowledgments. Would you like to do that? Sure, yeah. Okay, so let's hold your questions and, and go through acknowledgments and come back to Q&A. Cool. Thanks. Yeah, uh, okay, so I'll move on to the acknowledgment section. Um, and I'd like to take the moment to... Uh, thank uh, first my defense committee members. I'm grateful to Professor Marvo Kennedy for chairing this defense today. Uh, I unfortunately didn't get a chance to interact with you before, uh, but I've been greatly inspired by his work on motion planning and state estimation, in particular by the recent replay overshooting paper for state representation learning. I'm also grateful to Professor Darcy Sadi. I first met Darsa in her class on safe and interactive robotics. That class is still one of my top three classes that I ever took. I learned from her the vast field of algorithm Kuma robot interaction, as well as how to do critical literature review. And both of them highly inf influenced my research. So thank you for offering the great course and also joining the defense committee. Next, I'd like to thank my leading committee members. I'm grateful to Professor Grace Gao for kindly agreeing to joining the committee despite my sudden request in last February. Back then I felt honored when she said she'd remembered me from ICRA 2018, in which I presented a poster on active perception and talked to her when she was still a faculty member at UIUC. So thank you for all the valuable discussions and the feedback since then. I'm grateful to Professor Michael Cogendorfer. Michael is the reason I applied to Stanford Air Astro Department to take his class on decision-making under uncertainty. It was a fascinating, but also overwhelming class for me being a first year grad student, which in fact motivated me to learn more about optimal decision theory. So thank you, Michael, for sparking my academic interests, as well as your continued advice on my research. And finally, I'd like to thank my advisor, Mac. I couldn't think of being here today without you. And literally, I probably wouldn't have decided to pursue a PhD if I hadn't met you. 
At that time, I was indecisive about my career choice after the master's degree, since I was concerned about the competitiveness of PhD. And my thoughts were that the key to successful PhD would be to keep publishing papers in top journals and speaking at major conferences. So on one day, I walked into his office to tell him my honest concerns. And his response totally blew my mind and changed my narrow view of research and PhD. He said that PhD is not for publishing papers, but rather an, an opportunity to let your curiosity flow. That was the moment when I decided to go into the PhD program because it seemed so attractive. And this really, and this really represents Mac because he cares most about students being curiosity driven. And in addition to that, he gives precise feedback and guidance to maximize the students' creativity so that they can eventually speak at major conferences. Thank you, Mac, for being such a caring advisor. I admire you as an educator, a researcher, and a mentor, and I will always keep learning from you. Now, I'd like to thank the opportunity to collaborate with these amazing researchers over the years, Marco, Boris, Joe, Megar, and Adrian. Thank you for all the deep insights you gave me in tackling challenging robotics problems together. I especially thank Megar for all the amazing feedback and encouragements uh, I have received in difficult times. And I also thank Boris for sharing his unmatched expertise on deep generative modeling, as well as Python coding. The usability and the generalizability of Trajectron++ are just marvelous. I'm thankful to all the current and previous MSL members for all the intellectual discussions and the fun times that we have together. What's wonderful about MSL is that everyone is very open-minded and considerate in addition to all the cleverness and self-motivatedness. I especially thank Eric and Zhijian for being great mentors and studying for the tough air astro calls together. I also cannot forget all the help I got from Ravi, Adam, Kunal, Preston, Alex, Mingyu, and Junan. Whenever I had an issue with experiments or simulation results, they almost always knew an answer to move forward. It's hard to leave this home ground soon, but I'd love to stay connected to everyone in MSL even after I graduate. I thank all the friends I met here for making my life colorful. Without you, I'd be a lonely grad student without much activities outside the campus. I especially thank Andrew, Gary, Ben, Guy, and Keisuke for frequently taking me out of the lab to explore the nice local restaurants and exotic places over the years. I'm also thankful to the members of Stanford Japanese Association for all the commitment to the local community by co-organizing a party every quarter. Some of them have already returned to Japan, but I hope we can all gather in one place again someday. Thanks for all the great memories. And there are people who I want to give special acknowledgement to. They helped me get settled in this country and immersing to the local culture. They are always caring and considerate, helping me in many aspects in life, ranging from opening a US bank account to finding housing and even offering housing. I'm grateful to Paul, Gail, Nancy, Leo, Matt, Sam, Avinash, Nima, Cindy, Peter, Yvonne, Brian, and Karen. I can feel that I'm part of the local community because of you. Thank you very much for the long lasting friendship. Finally, I'd love to extend my sincere gratitude to my family in Japan. I thank my brother Yuki for taking care of everything I have after I left home. He always takes a firm stand in difficult circumstances, which I respect a lot. I know you're quite busy now, but hope that we can travel together around Japan again, just like we used to do. And I thank my dad, Michi, and my mom, Kazu, for always supporting my life decisions and encouraging me in tough times. I'm sure they had lots of anxiety when I am so far away from home, especially during the pandemic, but they never revealed that to me. Thank you for being such supportive and caring parents. I hope that you always stay safe and look forward to seeing you again soon. Yeah, so this is the end of the acknowledgement section. Um, thank you very much. Great, thank you, Hiroki. Let's give him one more hand. Okay, so um, we'll 
open it up for questions and you all, I think, can unmute yourselves and ask away. Uh, we've got a few minutes left. So yeah, feel free to, to ask Haruki anything before we move to the, the closed door session. Hey, Haruki. Um, congrats, that was an amazing um, defense. Thank I had you. a qu question. So a lot of your work, you're talking about like multi-agent systems, especially for like pedestrian interaction. And I think on one of your slides, you said like, this works up to like 50 pedestrians. Um, I was just wondering like, where should you draw the line between, like a, a person really isn't interacting with like 50 pedestrians. At some point they just think of them as like a crap, like a really big bunch of people, right? Like, um, so where, do you have any thoughts on like where to draw the line and what, what is right. practical? There, yeah. Right, it's a very, that's a very practical question. And I agree that in real life or in real engineering applications, we probably wouldn't have to uh, design a robot that could interact with a thousand people. You know, we could probably limit the, our attention to let's say the closest 10 or 20 or less humans. Um, but that's sort of uh, is a separate pro problem, like a practical problem that separates itself from like asking, is a method capable of doing handling as many humans as like 50 or 100 if it has to do? Because depending on the scene or maybe the situation uh, where the robots are deployed, for example, like a station in, in Tokyo, uh, like on, I don't know, like at 8 a.m. In, in the morning on, on week, like just like Monday or something, uh, you could see like literally really crowded like uh, platforms or like streets. Uh, and if you are to deploy a security robot there, then you would have to care about, let's say maybe like more than 20 or 30 pedestrians. So I think being able to handle as many pedestrians or as many, uh, as, as many dimensions as possible is an important capability Does cool. that answer your question? Yeah, it, it does. I guess like maybe a follow-up thought is, um, and you can answer other people's questions after this. It's like, at what point should the response robot be responsible for avoiding everyone? Like if there's like literally a hundred people around you, like yeah. all the responsibility shouldn't just be on the robot. Like there should be some, some maybe some level of cooperation, but I yeah. think that's like a deeper question. <laughs> yeah, I think it, it's that's that's a great point um and i agree with you it's kind of hard to maybe have to blame the robot for not avoiding 100 pedestrians at the same time but this is more of like a legal question or ethical question and as a designer or the engineer of, of the robotic system we'd have to make an assumption that the robot is responsible for uh, avoiding humans, even in like in the cooperative, cooperative environment. All right, thanks, Karen. Any more questions? Uh, maybe uh, just a, a quick question. So uh, first of all, congratulations, Haruki. That was an absolutely stellar defense. And having worked with you, I'm kind of like incredibly impressed by how accessible, you distilled the tremendous amount of very deep technical work uh, that has actually undergone uh, through your PhD. So congratulations. Um, and my question actually is a fairly high level. You hinted at this at the end. I'm kind of interested in your perspective. What do you think is the role of machine learning um, in, in the future? I'm, I'm really interested in your perspective on this. Yeah, so specific, there's one specific uh, or a couple of specific points uh, that I want to highlight. So uh, the role of machine learning is absolutely significant. We cannot ignore them. Uh, for instance, uh, I'm interested to answer this question of how can a particular model be learned that planning is successful? Because the planner will utilize that model that is learned by a machine learning algorithm utilizing data. And also, how to sort of like give safety assurances to such hybrid systems is a major question for which maybe machine learning systems can provide, for example, like this uh, error statistics between our um, 
going back to this slide, yeah, this error between our model and the ground truth data. Thank you. Does answer your question? Yeah, it does. Thank you. And congratulations again on all the, the great work and great presentation. Thank you. All right, terrific. So, uh, Monroe, if you're okay, should we close this session and move to the closed door session? Sounds good. Great. Let's give Haruki one last round of applause. Woohoo! Woo and uh, look forward to seeing the rest of the committee in the in the next session. Is it uh, Haruki? Is it in the same Zoom room, or do we have a separate room? Uh, it's a it's a separate. Uh... Okay. Room. Yeah. Great. I'll look for the link. Bye. Bye.